Well, good morning, church. It is uh, really good to be here. If you don't know me, I know Dave introduced me earlier, but my name is Jordan, and uh, I'm the pastor of Manu Northbury, and it's been a while since I've been up with you, but I was um, with our church this morning as we were setting up. We, we meet in a school gym, which means we got to do some things to make it uh, a place where we can worship, and so I was there this morning, and a few of them said, hey, tell, tell the congregation up in Aurelia, we said, hey, so I just wanted to bring our greetings to you. Uh, we love the reports of what we hear God is doing here. It's just so exciting. I know I get to chat with Dave uh, fairly regularly, and whenever he brings a report about the, the things that God is up to here, it's uh, super exciting, and so I'm really glad to be here with you today. Um, if you have a Bible with you, uh, as Dave mentioned, we are still continuing our series in the book of Proverbs. I'd love it if you'd open that up with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 3, and today we're going to be in verses 5 to 8 primarily. So Proverbs 3 verses 5 to 8 is where we're going to be, and I'm going to start by reading that. For you, Proverbs 3, verse 5, it says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. I want to start by asking you this morning, have you ever been given really bad advice? Like the kind of advice that's just really obviously horrible advice right away from the beginning. I remember um, a few years back sitting around a campfire with my brothers and my boss and all his buddies at his hunt camp. Don't ask me now how I ended up there. It's another story, okay? But uh, it was the summer my older brother was getting married. And so my boss and all his buddies were just giving him a hard time, right? You can imagine this hardened group of older men laughing at this younger guy who's getting married. And so they're giving him a hard time about it. And then they were going around the circle offering tidbits of advice on marriage. And most of them had been married several times. And I remember being like, man, my expectations for this advice were really low. But you have exceeded them significantly. Like just, it was really, really bad. Not good at all. Or how about this, maybe, do you remember the, the early days of COVID when it felt like the, the wild west of misinformation? Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we've, we've moved on from COVID enough that we can kind of laugh about this. Um, and this isn't offensive to anyone, and if it is, I know Dave would be happy to hear from you this week, okay? <laughs> so, uh, Dave.Whitelaw, I mean, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but I remember early on... Um, Seeing an article going around where, you know, there's all these things like, oh, it's very new and everyone's trying to figure it out. And, and I remember seeing this one that was like, so what happens is the virus gets in your airways. And so if you just drink lots of water, um, it'll wash it into your stomach and then your stomach acid will kill the virus or something like that. Anyone remember that? And I'd be like, man, if only a, a glass of water was the solution to the COVID pandemic. Mostly harmless. Or I remember, anyone remember that video? where the guy was like showing you how to disinfect all of your groceries before you, bought them into your, before you brought them into your home. And so I'm ashamed to say how long we watched that. And we're like, all right, we're doing this. And we just spent way too long, like, you know, wiping down the cans with a disinfecting cloth or something like that. Just not, in hindsight, not really great advice. Uh, one more, I remember a famous clip of a certain president suggesting um, that maybe we might be able to combat the virus by figuring out a way to inject disinfectant into her bodies or something like that. And the head doctor's beside him, and you see her face, and she's just, like, mortified about what's going on, right? Again, really bad advice. Now, some of that's harmless, but I want to ask you today, have you ever had any, like, really bad life advice, right? The sort of advice that maybe you listened to it, and it, you know, sent your life kind of spiraling downwards, or maybe you heard it and were wise enough to ignore it, or something like that. Have you ever had that sort of bad advice? Now, obviously, in the world of the internet and social media, there is no shortage of bad advice out there, right? It's like you can find bad advice all over the place, and yet I want to argue with you this morning that there's kind of one piece of bad advice floating around that has become so prevalent that it's become basically like gospel in our 21st century. It's like, all over the place. It's one of those, it's not one of those harmless and funny pieces of bad advice, but I think actually as we're going to come to see, it's actually deadly. And I, don't, and, I, and I don't use that word lightly. Which gives our task today some urgency because the passage we're going to look at that I just read from Proverbs chapter 3 in many ways you could say is like the antidote or the truth that we should be proclaiming in light of this common bad advice that we see 
floating around. You're going to see, we are going to see Proverbs go in an entirely different direction than what we see and hear in our world all the time. And here's the advice. You might have heard it, and it's this. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. Now, before we get into our passage today, it's worth, noticing, worth noting that the four verses we're going to be spending our time looking at today come in the context of another one of Proverbs addresses from a father to a son or from parents to a son. So if you look at chapters 1 to 9, what you're going to see are a lot of examples where a mother and a father, a father and a mother are going to come alongside their young son and say, son, hear, hear me out. And so, for example, in Proverbs 3, verses 1 to 2, you see this language. It says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. So we're kind of getting a window into a parent instruct, raising up their child and trying to point them towards the path of wisdom. Remember, uh, one of the primary things Proverbs wants us to do is to spend our lives chasing after wisdom, this, this skill at life that Proverbs says you need to live well in the world. In fact, Proverbs is saying if you listen to the words of this book, it's promising to give you that. And, and so we see that taking the form of a conversation between a father and a young son as maybe he's approaching his adolescent years or his young adult years in the same way that many of you fathers may have had conversations with your sons. And so here's what we're going to see today as we look at verses 5 date of chapter 3. First, we're going to talk about the father's instruction and then we're going to talk about the father's promise to his son. The father's instruction and the father's promise really simply. With all that being said, um, if you still have your Bibles open, I'd love it if you'd look back with me, and we're going to pick it up in verse 5 of chapter 3. And it says this, Trust in the Lord, father to a son, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. Now notice right away, two statements. One is positive and one negative. First, positively, trust in the Lord. And then negatively, do not lean on your own understanding. Now I want to spend a second unpacking what we mean when we talk about trusting in the Lord, because trust is one of those words um, if you've grown up in the church, I think you'll recognize that that's one of those Christian-sounding phrases or religious-sounding phrases that we use all the time, and maybe we don't actually know what we mean when we say that. And so what does it mean to trust in the Lord? In Hebrew, the word that's used here is the Hebrew word batach, and it's often actually used in a context that speaks about relying on someone or something for your security, right? I think we understand that. If you trust something, you're finding your security in it. In fact, um, most often, often in the scriptures, we see that being used in a negative sense, which means we see the biblical writers saying, do not trust in A, B, C, or D. Do not trust in strongholds. Do not trust in your chariots. Do not trust in your riches or something like that. So if the Bible was written today, maybe we would hear it saying something like this. Don't put your trust in your bank account. Don't put your trust in your country's military power. Don't put your trust in your political leaders. Don't put your trust in any one of the things that we might be tempted to find our security or our confidence to trust, right? Which is all of us. But here, the father is using it positively to say to his son, you should find your security, find your confidence. You should place your trust in the Lord. Place your trust in God. Now, it's worth noting here that at this point, you might be thinking, maybe, maybe you're here today with us, and uh, you've come with a friend or a neighbor, and, and I think Dave would agree with me, we're glad you're here, and maybe you'd say, I'm not really a re religious person, and so maybe you'd say, you know, trust is actually for, for those religious people, so I get why you guys are talking about it, but I, I'm the kind of person that likes to live my life based on the facts, right? I'm not interested in trusting anything. I just want to I want to live my life based on the facts. And while, while I appreciate the sentiment, um, I would just want to say to you, it's pretty hard to argue against the fact that everybody believes or trusts in something. So you, unfortunately, you don't really get a choice in whether or not you will choose to trust something. The only choice you get, the only choice you have is what you are going to trust in. There's just no way around it. We have this idea, there's this kind of idea in our secular 21st century culture that Trust and belief and faith, that's for religious people. Uh, but if you're sec think of yourself as a secular person, then, then that's not really for you. But in reality, the gap between religious people and secular people is not all that big uh, because everybody believes in something. Everybody is trusting in something. The difference is what we have chosen to trust in and put our faith in. So, for example, maybe you're just, you're like, you're just an average guy living in Aurelia, 2023, 
But even just to live your life, you must trust that at some level the things you're hearing from people are true, right? There's a lot of, a lot of ways that you have to put your trust. Maybe you fashion yourself as uh, someone who only believes in science. And so you're going to say something like, well, I only believe in what has been proven by scientific processes or something like that. And again, I would want to say that's great, except that that statement itself can't even be proved by science. You have to trust. You're trusting that science is the only real avenue that we have to truth. You're trusting that the scientific process that, processes that we've developed over thousands of years actually are a reliable source of information. And you're trusting that our minds have developed in such a way that we can understand that. No, do, like, do you understand what I'm saying here? Are you with me? Everybody must trust in something. Again, maybe at a more casual level. Um, everyone has some vision of what the good life is, right? Some ideal in your mind. Like, this is what I'm aiming for. This is, this is what is goodness, and this is what the good life is. Maybe you've never really spoken it, and yet subconsciously you are working towards that. And yet, even that, you are trusting that that vision of the good life that you've received from maybe your family or maybe from the friends or from your culture or from media or entertainment or your leaders, whatever that is, you're trusting, right, that that actually is a, a good life and it's worth pursuing. All of those things. So we don't really get a choice in whether or not we trust. All we get to choose is what we trust in. And, and while I don't have time to get into it now, I'm convinced that if you do enough digging in any one of those areas, whether it's science or all of those things, um, I think if you ask the right questions, you're going to find that those things actually aren't worthy objects of your trust. I'm not saying do away with science at all. I'm just saying that for you to base your life on that, I think you'll find there's shortcomings there, questions that science cannot answer. And I would just say your life is valuable and precious. You only get one chance. So don't you want to base your confidence on something that is trustworthy? And Proverbs right here, the father in Proverbs 3 is making the argument to the son that God is the only really trustworthy object that's worthy of you banking your entire life on it. God is the only option. Now, what does that trust look like? Well, two things. First, we would say, or Proverbs would say, that it's, it's a trust that is wholehearted. Look at the second half of that. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Now, again, if you've grown up in the church, you'll, if you're familiar with the scriptures, you'll know that the, the heart is something, it's a phrase that's used all throughout the Bible. And basically, when we see the Bible speaking about the heart, we should not be thinking about the organ that's pumping blood throughout your body, but more so, think about the, the very center of your being, the kind of command center for your life, the control center of your life that includes your thinking, it includes your, your planning and your desires, your loving and your wanting and your trusting. That's your heart. Author Dane Ortland said it like this, it is what gets us out of bed in the morning and what we daydream about as we drift off to sleep. It is our motivation headquarters. It defines and directs us. That is why Solomon tells us to keep the heart with all diligence for from it flows the springs of life. Another author, James Smith, argues that we should think of the heart as the fulcrum of your fundamental longings, a visceral subconscious orientation to the world. So do you, you guys understand what I'm trying to say here? The heart is like your, your deepest desires, the, the, the very center of your being, all the things you want and you long for and you're thinking about, that's your heart. Which means that when the father says to the son, trust in the Lord with all your heart, he's saying, listen, this should be wholehearted. This should be all of your life. This isn't, you're not dividing it up in one way and giving some of your heart to the Lord and some of it to something else. All of your life oriented towards your maker and you're created in a posture of trust, submission, finding your confidence in your security in him. That's the first thing. But I want you to see that the trust being called for here is wholehearted, but it's also relational. It's also relational. You know, um, the, the four verses we've been reading basically make the same point, like, in different ways. You're going to see, like, parallel statements again and again and again. But one of the ways the Father says it in verse 6, he's essentially saying the same thing as verse 5, but there's a nuance to it that I think is helpful. He says this, in all your ways, it's an important term, that means in all of your life, all of your, your conduct, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Now, that's a perfectly fine translation, obviously, but if you were to translate that more literally, one of the ways you might see that translated is, in all your ways, know him. In other words, there's, there's a, a relational component to that word. It's not just like confessing 
someone or this idea or this concept that we don't actually know, but Proverbs is saying there's a relational, knowledge-based component, this experience of knowing who God is. We're trusting in him as a person, as our creator and as our maker. Think about a, a child who, who trusts in their father or their mother, right? That, that trust is not devoid of their relationship. So when my kids trust me, hoping they do still, I think they're young enough, they don't, maybe don't know any better. They still trust me, but that's tied in to our relationship, right? Like they, they, they've come to know me as hopefully a, a good and loving father who cares for them and who has their best in mind. So there's a relational aspect to it. And in the same way, Proverbs is saying we trust God in all of our ways. We, we know him. We do life in the, in the presence of God, walking with him in relationship, trusting him as we go. In fact, you could argue that this is the very end for which we were created, right? To know God and delight in God ultimately what we're going to do for, for all eternity. Now, all of this, if you're a believer here, all of this is like, amen, I'm, I'm all in on this, right? But there's a catch. And, and the catch is this. Say, so in order for us to trust God in the ways we're being encouraged here, um, we must necessarily, listen to this, relinquish any trust that we've placed in ourselves. This is where it starts to get uncomfortable, okay? Look at the second part of verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now remember that if you guys spent some time in, in Proverbs 1-7, to I think you did a few weeks ago, um, the understanding is one of the things that Proverbs offers to give you. It's like one of those words that's tied in with wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge and understanding, right? But we're being reminded here that there is a sort of wisdom, there is a sort of understanding that does not come from the Lord, but comes from within yourself. That's why Proverbs identifies it as do not lean on your own. It is a self-wisdom. It's a wisdom of the world. It's an understanding of the world. It's an important distinction. And so in order to trust the Lord, we must necessarily become distrusting of ourselves. You cannot trust the Lord with all of your heart and acknowledge him and know him in all of your ways and fear him and at the same time live your life on the basis of your own understanding of what the world is like and what the good life looks like and what is right and wrong and all of those things that we're all tempted to think on a daily basis. So it means that if, if we want to truly trust God with all of our heart, we must allow God to do the, the difficult and painful work of slowly prying our fingers away from the grasp that they have on our own Selfish wisdom. Think about it like this. If you are, if you find yourself in a sinking boat, um, the way you demonstrate trust in a vessel, a boat that's not sinking, that's actually functioning and floating, is by getting out of the boat that's going down and getting into the boat that's functioning, right? You, you can't say on the one hand, I, I'm going to trust in this vessel that's working while you go down with the ship. That would be foolish, right? We understand that to demonstrate trust, you abandon the vessel that's sinking, and you give yourself fully to the vessel that is functioning, that is worthy of your trust, that's going to get you through, right? And there's a reason for this. There's a reason that the father is, is telling the son not to lean on his own understanding. And the reason is that there's, there's another aspect of the human heart that, that I haven't talked about yet. And the Bible is really clear about this as well, and it's this. It's that, yes, we all have a heart. Yes, it's the, the center of our being. We don't have a choice. We have to use it. And yet, the human heart has been deeply corrupted by sin. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17 said it like this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So the bad news is, the heart that all of us have, the center of our will and desires and our thinking... Jeremiah is saying, it's, there's an issue there, it's, and it's desperately sick. It's been corrupted. Who can understand it? Anyone else feel that on a daily basis? The warring desires within your heart, the way your own heart wants to lead you astray to things that you know are not good for you? The Bible would say that's because it's sick. Sin has rendered your heart unreliable as a guide to morality and wisdom in, in all of those things. In Mark 7 um, Jesus said it like this. He's basically making the point in context that it's not what comes from outside of you and goes within you that defiles you, but actually what's within you that comes out. Listen to what he says in Mark 7. Quote, for from within, 
Listen to this, because this, this flies in the face of everything you will hear in the world. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these things, listen to this, come from within you. And they defile a person. So that's a... I don't know about you, but that's a pretty heavy list, right? Like that's some of the, the who's who of big sins in the world. And we might paraphrase what Jesus is saying here by saying something like this. Basically, Jesus would say all of the worst atrocities that have ever been committed in our world were committed by people who are following their heart. Right? That's what he's saying. All of this stuff comes from within man. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft. So if we're taking Jesus seriously, like, you should be careful who you tell to follow their heart because it might cost you your life, depending on what's going, in the, going on in their heart, right? All of these things. And church, I would, I would want to say, like, our world has this obsession with the inward journey. And whenever you hear someone talking about that, you will notice that there seems to be this idea that the deeper you go within yourself, the more you will find something pure and unadulterated and uncorrupted, right? You guys familiar with that kind of language? As I, as I saw it deep within myself and discovered who I really truly am, all of those things, right? We have this idea that what is outside of us is the corrupting force, and what is inside of us is pure. And so salvation in our modern world is you, you dive deep into your own heart to find what's there. Jesus in his wisdom says that the deeper you go inside, the more you will find the problem and not the answer. And it's exactly why the language, this is exactly why the language we hear today is so devastating because this has become just dogma in our 21st century world. Everywhere you look, you will see the same message. Follow your heart. Trust your heart. Don't listen to anyone else. Be who you most truly are. All of those things. Be your own guide. Trust your own wisdom. We indoctrinate our kids with this, our graduates with this. It's the pervasive thread through most of our entertainment. And essentially, Proverbs is saying this is a recipe for disaster. Right? Now, maybe you're like, oh, that's like a, a, a highly negative way of viewing that phrase. We don't mean like murder someone when we say follow your heart. We don't mean that. That's not what we're talking about. And, and fair enough, I agree. Like that's not what most people mean when they use that phrase. But I'm just, I'm trying to lay it out for us so that we understand. My point is your heart is unreliable. It's unreliable. It's not the best guide. It's a, it's a compass that is not working properly. And so we need to be aware of this dynamic because I think a lot of us, and friends, I would just say this stuff has made its way into the church as well. If we're just really honest, a lot of us live with this idea as if anything that, that seems to feel good or makes sense to me, if I can kind of wrap my mind around and be like, yeah, yeah, that's, I think that, that just feels good and we kind of intuit our way through life, if we feel it deeply, it must be right. Proverbs 16, 25 says it like this, there is a way that seems right to a man but its end is the way to death. So that's the, that's the sober warning of Proverbs that I, that I want to put before you today is that you may, in following what feels right and good to you, you may lead yourself into destruction and death. I'm, like, I'm not even, that's what Proverbs is saying. I know you're like, man, guest preacher, heavy message today, right? But that's, that's what Proverbs 3 is saying. Now, the conundrum is this, of course, is that all of us have a heart and we must use it, so to speak, but on its own, it's not trustworthy. So what do we do? Well, the father is saying to the son, the only thing that you can really do is use that, that, that heart that is unreliable in itself to orient yourself towards the only one who is trustworthy, which is God. Right? You, you want to leave the heart as an end in itself, live according to its wisdom, it's going to lead you astray. But at the same time, with all of your heart, you orient yourself towards a trust in God. So if I was into catchy phrases, I'm not really, uh, I'd say something like this. This is what Proverbs is saying. Don't trust in your heart, but trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't trust your heart, but trust in the Lord with all of your heart. You get that on a coffee mug or something like that. Proverbs way of wisdom. Now, that's the essence of the Father's instruction to the Son. Now maybe you're wondering, well, why would I do this? Okay, I think there's Good reasons we've already talked about why you would do this. But, but um, 
It's a risky endeavor, right? Because everyone's saying the opposite. So if you're going to listen to what the Father's saying, you're going to have to be willing to be swimming upstream, so to speak. You're going against the, the flow of the world right now. So what's in it for you? Why would I do this, so to, so to speak? And at this point, it's worth noting that the Father does not shy away from giving his son a sort of promise or reward, so to speak, if he is to give himself over to trusting the Lord in this way. And so I think there's, there's two promises that we're going to see the Father make to the Son in this regard. Before we get there, um, I want to mention this really quickly. It's possible Dave has already said this. Um, I hesitate to call these promises because of the nature of what the book of Proverbs is. I do think they are a sort of promise, but they may not be the sort of promise that you are thinking of. And what I mean to say is um, we would look at the book of Proverbs and say these are truthful statements that are generally true, right? But maybe not like mathematically true all of the time, right? So the worldview of Proverbs is kind of like, listen, if you do these things, if you, you give yourself over, if you seek wisdom, if you love the Lord, if you trust him, if you fear him, all of those things, you do that and there is an outcome with that. Your life will go well, it will, you'll have long, all of those things. And we would say, yeah, there's certainly truth to that statement. And yet we also know that there are a lot of people who love the Lord deeply, who fear the Lord, they give themselves over to him fully, and yet their life, for whatever reason, is just marked by suffering and, and devastation. Um, this is why the book of Job is in the Bible, right? It's filling out our picture of biblical wisdom in different ways, where we see a righteous man whose life is plunged into ruin, and we're left thinking, whoa, this is a, a different take on this, right? So, so the promises we get here, we've got to filter them through that lens of what, what Proverbs is, is trying to do. Is that fair? So here's the, here's the first promise that the Father makes to the Son. Look at verse 6 again with me. This is what he says there. Again, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. He will make straight your paths. Now, again, just to be clear, I don't think Proverbs is saying, listen, if you, you trust the Lord, life will be easy for you. It's going to get rid of all the bumps, all of the zigzags in the road, and it's just going to, life will unfold before you, and it's off into happily ever after or something like that. That's not, that's not the promise that is being made here. But I think the straight path here is a path that is in contrast to a path that is crooked or perverse. So there's a, a moral dimension to this promise. The Father's saying, listen, if you trust in the Lord, there's a sense in which God will keep you from evil. He will keep you from the way of folly. He will keep you from making a shipwreck of your life by giving yourself over to foolishness. Now, I think if we're honest, it, even for, for followers of Jesus, it's not always easy to see this, right? I loved um, one scholar, Bruce Walke, I was reading this week, said, said this about this verse. He said that one has to view the course of one's life from a bird's eye view, not from a worm's eye view, to see this truth. I think that's really helpful. You know, when I look at my own life, um, in my own struggle with sin, my own journey following Jesus, trying to put to death the deeds of the flesh and walk by the Spirit. Um, if I look at that in the day-to-day, -day, I'd be like, Lord, man, that does not feel like a straight path. Right? It feels like every day I'm going left, right, trying to follow Jesus and keep my mind in check and manage this heart that loves Jesus and wants to follow him and yet is wayward in so many ways. Like It doesn't feel like a straight path. And yet, when I take a broader vision and remember all that God has done in my life, I, I start to see things a little bit differently, right? When I look at the entirety of my life following Jesus, I see it can start to track the ways that, that God has been, been guiding me and keeping me and protecting me. I can see the way he steered me through my anger and the angst and temptations of my teenage years. And I can see the way he guided me through my young adult years and led me to a place I would have never chosen, and yet in his wisdom, he had prepared for me. Right? All of those things are true. So when you step back from the day-to-day -day of your life following Jesus and just track, and I just invite you to do this as we think about that, just notice all of the ways that God has been providential toward you, the ways that he's been guiding you up to this point. Never once failing you, never once abandoning you. You know, one of, the, one of the ways I think we see this promise worked out in the New Testament is, is what Paul said to the Philippian church. I love this. He said, I am confidence, confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Paul's saying, I am sure of this, that the work God started in your life when you gave your life to Jesus, that will be finished. You will not get lost along the way. And you look at the day-to-day, -day and yeah, there might be days where you're wandering and tough periods or weeks or months where you have doubts and all those things. And yet, the promise is that 
I am confident that I, God will see you through. So you get where he wants you to go in the end when Jesus returns. It's a beautiful promise. But then there's a second promise that we see in verse 8, and it's this. The father says to the son, if you trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not on your own understanding. If you're not wise in your own eyes, but if you fear the Lord and turn away from evil, it will be healing to your fl- flesh and refreshment to your bones. Now again, do, do Christians avoid all disease and sickness? Is cancer not an issue for Christians? I think we know from experience the answer is, is no, that's not true. But I think what's going on here is that The Father is using physical bodily language to describe the well-being of the whole person. And I think we're at a place in a world where we can understand that you can be really physically healthy, right? Bodily healthy and well, and yet be mentally, emotionally really sick in some serious ways. We, We understand that now, right? And I think the inverse is also true, that I've met people who are sick and dying, and yet you look at them and like, man, they feel so alive, right? Like God by his spirit is doing such a work in their heart that even though their body is, is dying, that you're like, man, I wish I could just like soak up all the learn from you because you seem like someone who is joyful and you're trusting and you're at peace and there is wholeness and healing that's taking place in your life. And so I believe that there's a sense in it, that's what's going on here. If you give your life over to trusting God, surrendering your own ideas and thoughts and plans, there is a a vitality and a wholeness and a healing that God begins to bring into your life through his Holy Spirit as he makes you more like Jesus. I think Paul, Paul said it like this, though outwardly we are wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So he's saying there's, there's, your life might have, your, your being might have parts of you going in two different directions. Your body might be wasting away and you might say, oh man, this is going down. On the other hand, Paul's saying inwardly, you're actually being renewed day by day. You're becoming more like Jesus as you grow in his likeness and as the Spirit does his work of healing. Now, I want to say on a side to that, which is this. This does not mean our bodies are unimportant. And in fact, I would argue that in the gospel, we do have the promise of healing if we understand that properly, which is that The gospel promises you that there is a day when you will be raised with Jesus, right? Doesn't promise you healing for everything in this life, certainly not, we know that. And yet the promise of the gospel is that there's a day coming when Jesus will return and our very physical bodies will be raised for life in the new heavens and the new earth. One other thing I would want to mention is that we see this promise being fulfilled in the new covenant that we have in Christ. That is to say that when Ezekiel, and you could bring up Jeremiah as well, don't have time to read that. When they foresaw what God was going to do through his son in the new covenant, one of the things that they highlighted was that in that day, the people of God would actually receive new hearts. This is Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27. He said, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart. And a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So this is the beautiful promise of the new covenant is that that God actually replaces our wayward, broken corrupted hearts with hearts that are new and he actually fills us with the spirit so that the law is written on our hearts and we actually begin to by God's grace desire to obey God desire to walk in obedience to him that's that's the promise of the gospel is that we're actually changed from the inside to live according to the ways that that God has laid out for us now all of this is is really good but there's a question that, that still kind of floats out there, right? The, the father says to the son, listen, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and, and here are the ways in which that will be life to you. How do we do that, right? How do we cultivate as a church this deep trust in God and this deep distrust in our own wisdom in a world that just wants to drag you day after day into a sort of self-worship or self-idolatry that wants you to live on your own wisdom, that wants you to follow your heart, that wants you to reject any external wisdom like that? How do we do that? What does it look like for us to grow in these ways, and while I certainly don't presume to offer a definitive answer to that question in closing, I just want to 
offer humbly here a few things I think that will be critical for us as the church in the 21st century if we are to, in fact, walk in obedience and to grow in our trust of the Lord. And, and so the first is this. There's four things, and I'll be really quick here. First, I think, church, we must be a church that is really well-versed and steeped in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know when I say that, there, there might be a temptation for, the, for you to think, oh, you're a pastor, you've got to say that. But I, I'm, not just, I'm not just giving this a hat tip. I really, I really deeply believe that the gospel is essential to this in this battle. Think about, like, think about what the good news is, church. At the heart of the gospel message, the good news of Jesus is the invitation to repent and to believe in Jesus. That's what, when Jesus enters the scene in the Gospel of Mark, right away, the first thing he comes proclaiming is the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance and belief or repentance and trust. In other words, repentance is our turning away from self and from sin and from the life of the flesh, right? That's what we do. We turn and we run from that. And our believing is our turning to and embracing and trusting all that Jesus is and the kingdom that he's bringing and all that he will accomplish on the cross. That's the invitation of Jesus in Mark chapter 3. To look at the crucified and risen Jesus and believe that by God's mercy our sins have been paid for and that we are righteous as we are united to him. So the very first step we take in our Christian life is this. We look away from self and we turn to Jesus in trust. That's the gospel. So if we begin to adopt a Christianity whereby we receive that message, and then yet, as many of us are tempted to do, begin to live a life where we think we must therefore earn God's grace by our own obedience, and we pursue the sort of self-justification by works or by the law. We begin looking away from Jesus and looking to self. If, If that's the sort of attitude that marks our churches, then I think it will follow that pretty soon after we will start looking away from the wisdom that Jesus offers and looking also to our to our own wisdom. You see what I'm saying? There's a sense in which self-justification, the road of self-justification, will lead to the road of self-understanding. As long as we forget the gospel, we are at risk of becoming wise in our own eyes. But church, when we keep the gospel of Jesus at the center, we learn day after day the rhythms of repentance and belief, turning from and trusting towards Jesus Christ and all that he is. We need to keep the gospel centered. Second is this, church, we must be immersed in the word more than we are immersed in the world. Here's the, here's the reality. You don't have a choice. Um, you are immersed in the ways of the world day after day. You don't, you don't get to decide that, right? And even further than that, necessarily, um, we are all being formed by the world in ways that we don't understand, right? You, you go out work in your workplace and with your neighbors and engage in public life, you shows you watch, all of the, all the ways of the world get their claws into you and they begin to form you in its own image, right? That's, that's what happens in the world that we live in and that's, there's no choice. But the antidote, the only way that we counteract that is by making sure that our churches are communities of, of what we might call counterformation, where we, we come and we learn and we worship and we get ourselves into the word of God so that we might be formed, not according to the ways of the world, but according to the word of God. That's what discipleship is. That's what we do when we gather. We come, we sit under the word, and there's a sense in which it's just reorienting us again and again and again, week after week, day after day, community, our uh, missional community, after missional community, serving in kids' men every week, all of those things, right, are ways that we begin to form ourselves after the way of Jesus, and crucial in that struggle is the time that we spend in God's word, church. Absolutely critical. This this is where we find God's wisdom, right? This is, as an evangelical church, we believe this is God's very word to his people, that he has chosen to reveal himself through the scriptures, so that when you open this up, when we open up Proverbs, we're not just looking at good advice, we are looking at divine revelation spoken through humans, so how God has chosen to unveil his wisdom for us. And so there's a sense in which, listen, like if, we, if, if our time in God's word is not keeping up with the ways that we are immersed in the world, like we are fighting, it. we're already fighting an uphill battle, right? But this is a critical weapon in the fight that we have as we seek to follow Jesus. The third is this. 
we must follow Jesus in community. We must follow Jesus in community. And I think as life in the West gets harder for followers of Jesus, we will need to rediscover the gift of Christian community as it's presented to us in the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament. In other words, God has given us each other as a gift so that as we follow Jesus together, we might encourage one another and cultivate in each other this trust that's being commanded here in Proverbs, right? I don't, I, like, I don't know about you guys, but there are some times when, you know, you're living your life throughout the week and there's a lot going on and you come into church and you see your brother or sister show up to church and you see them worshiping beside you and you look at the congregation of the saints together and there's part of you that's like, man, I'm not crazy, Right? Or maybe not entirely crazy. It's a little bit of crazy in all of us maybe. But right, like there's a sense in which we see one another and it's encouraging to us. And we think, man, I, yes, like it is good and right to trust in the Lord. We do life together. Maybe you show up at your missional community and you've had a particularly discouraging week. And you feel tempted to doubt the goodness of God. And you hear a brother or sister give testimony to a way that God has answered a prayer of theirs that they've been praying for years, right? And it just builds this trust in you for who God is and all that he's doing. Like we we need each other. God has given you to each other as a gift to cultivate this deep faith and trust in all that that God is doing. One of the things I, I, I say this to our church all the time, I wouldn't be able to get away with saying it again, but I'm new here so I can... This will sound new to you, is that one of the things I love in the book of Hebrews is you have this command to not neglect gathering. But one of the things that book says is that it's not just good for you to gather, but it's good for other people. So it's it's good for you to be here, for sure. You need to be here. But your brother and sister also need you here, that we might build each other up in the Lord. That's the, the direction that Hebrews takes. We'd encourage one another as we see the day of the Lord approaching. Finally, I would just say this, and this might be one of the most difficult for us to learn, and I think that in order for us to learn how to be a people of trust in a a world of self-trust is that we have to learn to practice the art of self-suspicion. And what I mean by that is that we just need to learn, church, that not everything that we feel deeply is necessarily good. In other words, you might say we need to learn to practice discernment within our own heart. Oftentimes when we, when we think about discernment, we think about voices that are out there, right? And that's good. We need to be discerning about, you know, teachers and the inputs that we give to our life and just be assessing those according to the word of God. All of that is true. But I think where a lot of people fail is that they think that that's only true for external voices and forget that I've actually got to do that with my own heart as well. And just be assessing on a day-to-day basis. Man, I really feel pulled in this direction, is that a desire that's coming from God or is that just my own selfish fleshly desires acting up again? Do I need to submit them to the word of God? And, and, I, and I don't want to be overly pessimistic because yes, I already made the point, God has given you a new heart if you're a follower of Jesus. You have his spirit and so we should expect that God will give you good dreams and he will give you good desires. He will lead you to to take risks of faith for him, to step out, to follow him in the world, all of those things. And you may feel that deep within your being, right? But it's a mixed bag too. Because alongside all of those good godly desires, we find desires that are not good and godly. And I think oftentimes we're at risk of actually believing those and just kind of sanctifying them, right? Right? And Christianizing desires that are, are not actually, you know, maybe you're like, I just, I can't commit to church. I just, I just need some, me and the Lord just need some, some time, you know? And you're like, well, that, I, okay, I appreciate that. But like, be at church and, and take that time instead of golfing or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's just ways that we kind of sanctify these desires that ultimately are, are fleshly. So be discerning, church. Be discerning about the, the thoughts and feelings that you have in your heart. Now, there's a, there's a lot more I could say, but I just offer these to you as, as basics for orienting your fickle heart, our fickle hearts, towards trust in God and not towards trust in self. Know the gospel. Get in the word. Or better, let the word get into you. Do life in community and practice discernment in your own heart. And, and here's, the, here's the really good news, church, as, we, as I wrap this up, and it's just to say this. That in every way, God has shown himself to be entirely trustworthy. 
He has never let you down. And he will never let you down. God has never failed you once. If you are a follower of Jesus, you can trust that all of, all of your ways, God has been walking with you and seeing you through those things. And whether or not you can see it now, whether or not you have doubts about all that God is up to, the test, I know from my own life, I know the leadership here would, would testify to this gladly. And as we look at the scriptures, again and again and again, we see God never, ever fails his people. You can trust him, church. It might cost you lots in the currency of the world. But in giving up your own desire to follow your own heart, you will be gain some, gaining something that is so much more precious, so much more valuable, and so much more reliable. And I, I believe that as we, as we do these regular rhythms together over a lifetime, you will become a, a person of trust, a disciple of Jesus who is growing in your trust of God, learning to discern the voices that are going on within your head and within your heart. As we pray today to close, um, I, I want to just invite the Spirit of God to sort of help us uh, take inventory of our own hearts and invite Him just to do the work of conviction if there are areas where we have kind of wandered, where we have placed our trust in something other than God. <clears throat> and so if you would, I just invite you to pray with me and, and open yourself up to the work of God in that way and I'll just lead us in a prayer and you can join me and then we're going we're gonna to close worshiping together. So, Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we, we love you. And Lord, we just want to affirm, we believe that you are entirely trustworthy. And Father, I don't know what, um, yeah, what's going on in the lives of the people who have, you have gathered here today. The ways that they're being challenged, the ways their faith is being tested. And yet we just, we recognize together that you are absolutely trustworthy. Lord, you have never failed us. And so I'm just praying for your help, Father, and I'm asking that if there are ways that our heart has wandered, that you would reveal those to us. Father, I pray that we would just sense you, you calling us back to yourself. And I pray that there would be yeah, a, a real confidence in all that you are. Lord, I want to pray for this church, and I thank you for the, the way that they're bearing witness in this city. And I ask that as they grow in their trust of you, that, that others would see in a world where they're just exhausted from the message of following their hearts and, and all of that, that they, they would see this invitation to trust in you as a lifeline and the chance to truly be alive. We love you, Lord, and we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus.